So let, why don't you give them the battery skin? Okay. Why don't we go off this? Just kind of speed it up a little bit because they okay. are new, and batteries are going to be a huge thing. Okay. So what we typically do is uh, we try and stay by uh, this sheet that he and I made 100 years ago. Feels we start like out with batteries. Batteries are the heart of your your coach. If you have a high tech, all electronic. If you have the best quality gas chassis motorhome on the market, they all the heart of these coaches is the 12 volt system. The 12 volt system controls all of the switches, all of the motors, uh, all of the electronic modules, your ignition, your controls for your slides, your controls for your jacks. Nothing works in the coach if the batteries are not in good condition. One of the things that a lot of people don't know, which is his topic, is uh, what is a dead battery? What is the voltage rate of a dead battery? Well, 12 6 is full. So a fully charged battery is rated at 12 6. 12, 6. 12 is half. 12 is half. And at 11.8, all your electronics in your coach will start to fail. So, so your lights will start going dim at 11.8. By 11.6, 11.5, nothing's working at all. So if, work. if oh, I yeah. call you up and I say, <laughs> Ouch. if I call you up and I say, well, I still have 10 volts in my battery, nothing works. Yeah. Meaning is it's a dead battery. Yeah. So that's. We get that a lot. Because it, it can't pull the power to do what it needs to do. There's no more potential left in that battery. The yeah. current that, that lets lead and sulfuric acid reaction has been spent. It's, it, there's nothing left to react. So they're saying that when a, and when a battery gets down to 11.6, I think it is, it has consumed 95% of its energy. There's nothing left. Can you rebound from that? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Especially, especially with up. deep cycle. That's why they're called the deep cycle RV battery. They're meant to go way down and come back up, and way mm -hmm. down and come back up. So now an older battery, if you've had a deep cycle battery for a couple of years and you run it down to four volts, there's a good chance it may not. But keep your batteries in good shape for you know a year or two, they're great. Batteries are batteries. They get used hard in RV. Sorry, I no, you the can go. they get used hard. So don't be surprised if your factory batteries last a year and a half to two years and that's I it. See. Okay. All right, not that not a vehicle six to seven years then on it. No, on no a charging battery is set no. different. It's, it, it's set to discharge a little while you start and then go right back up. It goes like this forever. That's why you'll have that battery in your truck for five or six years. Right. The first time you leave the glove box open and it goes down to here, all that up and down abuse for seven years, when it went to the bottom, never wants That's to come back out. Okay. The deep cycle was designed to do that. There, he can go into a scientific as far as the thickness and all that, but factory basic batteries are good for a couple years. Okay. That's if you maintain them. That's a good main. That's a good maintenance. maintain the, the water. Right. New, uh, the new air does that come with sealed batteries? Yeah, there are AGMs. There's six of them. Okay, we're going to talk about AGMs a little bit for you because more than likely your base star has liquid. They're flooded. Two twelve volt flooded. Flooded. So he's going to kind of go over yeah. flooded and deep cell. And if you're going to go full timing, he'll, uh, when you replace your batteries, if in two years you replace them and you decide you like full timing, spend the money. It's one of the best investments you can make is to upgrade your batteries to a gel cell battery. And so he'll explain that. Okay. When, when you've got multiple batteries and you've got the readouts that, that are telling you those, that level, are they going to tell you the level of the lowest battery? The average. The average. Yeah. Because they're all tied oh, they're together. They're going to take, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's start at the beginning. Now that we're halfway through it, there's basically two types of batteries. There's the type of battery you use to start the engine. Uh, it's a starting battery. We're familiar with those. We have them in all of our vehicles. The cranking batteries have a lot of plates. They're thin plates. A lot of them, a lot of surface area. So the sulfuric acid, has a lot of contact with lead. They are designed to discharge a large amount of current over a short period of time. Now, the problem is, is there's not very much lead on each of the plates. 
these plates can discharge like he was talking about and never come back. They deplate, there's nothing to electroplate that lead back on them again. So we don't use starting batteries for any form of deep cycle. We don't, we, we try not to let them discharge at all. So we have battery disconnects for that reason. Typically, even the RV starter batteries will last five, six, seven years. Now the battery that we are most concerned with is the deep cycling battery for the house. They have much fewer plates, they're much larger, they're thick, not a lot of surface area, but they can deplate over a long period of time and they can cycle deeply and come back. The, the, the types of batteries... Wonderful, come on in, we've got a few more. Sorry, that lady. Sorry, That's okay. No, you're fine. We're happy to have you. My name is Dan. Uh, this I'm is Dave. Dave Taylor. He's our service director. I just sit here and listen to him talk most of the morning. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we're talking about batteries. This is where we usually start out. Uh, do you guys have a coach? We will in about an hour. Oh, awesome. There you go. Congratulations. <laughs> a, a motor home or a trailer or a fifth wheel? Fifth wheel. All right. My man. <laughs> so, batteries that we're talking first about the starter, they, they don't like to be cycled. You need to maintain them. A deep cycle is designed to go long term power output to power the house, all the items in your coach. Deep cycles are rated in duty cycles. The flooded cell, which is what you have, what you would probably have unless you upgraded, are a flooded cell and they're wet. They have water, sulfuric acid, and lead. Flooded cell batteries, they're a good starter first battery. They have a fairly decent duty cycle, which is Fully charged, 12 and a half, 13 volts, down to 11 and a half volts, which is where they're technically dead. There's no energy left in that battery much below 11 and a half volts. There's just not much left. They can charge up and down on a floated cell about 180 to 250 times. If you get into an absorbed glass mat battery, they're a sealed battery. She's got the sealed batteries. What they are, you've got a fiberglass pouch, they put the lead plate in and impregnate it with a sulfur sulfuric acid gel. They press them together, there's nowhere for the chemicals to go, so you, you, they're not vented, they can be in the compartment with you, they don't leak, they last quite a bit longer. Where this battery, the flooded cell, will cycle 180 to 250 times, this one will do three to four hundred, um, maybe even more. Much better battery. If you have an inverter solar panels where you're doing a bigger demand on the battery, you have a household refrigerator in your coach, so you have a 1,000 watt inverter and two 12 volt batteries. If you do dry camping, you're going to find out immediately that those two batteries are not going to be much for you. So then we need to look at alternatives. Do you have a household RV or is it a, is it a propane fridge? It's a propane <coughs> <coughs> Are you thinking of, you're not going to dry camp much, are you? Well, we, we were every now and then, yeah. <coughs> okay. well, it, it does go, it does go back and forth between propane and electric. So there isn't household that if it has propane. Yeah, yeah, if it has So it, it, it has an option to go and so that's yeah, just the, explained to us is that it would search for the best power source that it could use. I see. Yes. Yeah. So that's yes. that's a regular RV refrigerator. Good. You don't have to worry about okay. battery stuff. So anyway, there's there's a third kind of battery out there. It's a lithium ion. We looked at it. <laughs> Fifteen hundred dollars a battery for what? We're we're not that interested. Basically, the AGM. Once you've been in the industry for a while. This is where you're going to want to be. They last two to three times as long. There's no maintenance. They're more durable. Uh, very good batteries. We sell them. Um, are you going to be doing a lot of dry camping? Or are you going to live in it? Uh, we're not going to live in it. Okay. 
weekends and weeks, stuff yeah, like that, the yeah. standard. Yeah. Okay, what kind yeah. of a fifth wheel did you buy? Fox. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah great. Those are good Northwood's great manufacturer. Yeah. Can I say Northwood? On, <laughs> can I say <laughs> Northwood? <laughs> Daryl? It's okay to say Northwood, right? So being live stream, so you have to be careful about what you say. Or say I said it four times in a row, so I think we're okay. So on the water batteries, how often do service need to be taken on it that I can do? Okay. Yeah. How often you, go I ahead. You, you, your turn. You're going to be full timing. You're going to be weekending. Full timing. You're going to be plugged in a ton. So you're going to want to check those batteries at least once every two or three weeks until you get in. Until you know about when to check them. Once you start noticing the depreciation in your levels of fluid in your battery, you'll know that you only need to check them every three weeks or six weeks. Okay. I just get a regular schedule. Just get a regular schedule. And if you water? check it every three weeks and they're full, then next time try four weeks. See how long it takes. Weekends, you need to check your batteries every two to three months to top them off. So we fill them with distilled water. Distilled water. And how much would a battery take for filling it? Low. Well, if it's low, it's a pint. Shouldn't okay. take much. It shouldn't take, shouldn't take much. Once you take the top off, you'll see a level in there, a level indicator. If you ever let it get to the point where the uh, acid and water are below the lead plates, then just buy new batteries. Right. Once you've done that, you've basically ruined the battery. I've heard people say, oh, you can hypercharge it and do all this stuff. You, you can spend hundreds of dollars in 50 hours when you can just go down and get some new batteries. Okay. Right. They just don't re they don't recover. They had to recover they had to replace a chassis battery. When we said that the number four, that's what the chassis battery was running at like two weeks ago. Yeah. And so they had to replace that. But um, Yeah, they get the chassis they batteries get used quite a bit on a on a around here. No idea what well, your, your new bar is going to draw off of it off the radiator mm -hmm. because it's wired directly to, and they don't, they won't let us change it to the house side. Yeah. So you have new bars have a pretty high amp draw on the chassis battery. So usually, even with the batteries disconnected, mm -hmm. so usually we let new bar customers know if you're not going to be in it, you need to start the engine every three days. That's what we've been doing. Yeah. And just letting it run. How long would be a well, minutes. your new Mar has a bi-directional, we're getting ahead of ourselves, sorry. No, you're Yours has fine. a bi-directional isolator in it. So when you're plugged in, it should be charging the chassis battery. Okay. After the house battery is a complete charge, it trickles over into the chassis. I see, okay. It's people that don't plug in. It's when they store it in there next to the house. So they store it for a couple weeks and go out and it's dead, and then they call us, why is it dead? Well, there's parasitic draws that pull pretty heavy amps. So you have to start every three days. So that answers the question why when I looked at the meter, the chassis batteries were charging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not the chassis, the house batteries were charging. Right. Because chassis you're... battery wasn't changing. It was waiting for the house, house. batteries to be charged. And then yeah. it would have done that. And right. then I yeah. panicked and it was button pushing. So, so all right, I got it. Yeah. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So we should move into the charging. You want to do that or you Talk sure. about the charging systems? Sure. Okay. Uh, charging. We basically talked about when you plug in, yours has a bi-directional isolator in it that will do that because you have chassis and house. They only have house batteries. You have chassis and house. Yours has a bi-directional relay. It's nice to have so few people. I know exactly what you own. Yeah. And so yours, you just plug it in. That charges it. Or while you're driving, it charges off the alternator, and that bi-directional opens the other direction. Once your chassis battery is full, it will start charging your house battery while you're driving. Yeah. So if you're charging, plugging in and charging, does 30 amp and 50 amp make a difference for charging the chassis battery? Or Not on the charging, no. Usage, yes. Okay. So, so if we go to a campground that only has 30 amp and we plug it in, are we assuming it's still charging? Battery. Still charging the batteries. Okay. Yes, yeah, go ahead. So uh, you, you peeked on that one too. So yeah, I have a question about that because yeah. it's a 50, the actual machine is 50, but they're only 30. Yeah. 
you both have 50 amp, all three of you have 50 amp potential, but you can make that down to 30 amp. What that means is, if you look at your cord, your cord has four plugs, and I'm a spaz so I can't do it right, but it has four pins on it, and what that is is a neutral ground and two legs. So you have a 30 amp service and a 20 amp service, which really another 30 amp. But anyway, so if you pull into an older campground that only has 30 amp service, only one of your two legs is going to be powered. Now, typically, the the first leg, the black wire, powers everything in your coach: your main air conditioner, your microwave, your charge circuit, things hey, like hey, that. Is that referred to in the silver leaf as leg one? Yes. Leg one. Because yes. it shows leg one and leg two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah that's leg one. If you pull into a campground that has 50 amp service, then you're going to be able to use both air conditioners and the washer and dryer, and you're going to be able to use the water heater on electric and things like that. Now, yours is a slightly different because even on leg one, you can use your hydraulic heating, and uh, I think you can use leg one on the electric assist on the hydraulic heating. Hydraulic heating. No. Oh, well, well, there's a question there. Yes. We're going to go ahead. So, and maybe this is the right time to ask that. That's okay. right. There's, there's a lot of this with yours that we're going to want to spend with Dan. And, yeah. yeah, and I don't want to take up. Okay, and that's what I'm afraid yeah. we're going to yeah. get yeah. so deep yeah. we're going to confuse her. Oh, yeah. really she has basically a coach pretty close to that. So, and it's new. We've known her for, we're like family. Except she never brings Dan and I cookies. <laughs> so she, they just purchased it. <laughs> so, yeah, we're we'll, we'll still answering your questions, but a lot of that's going to be so yeah, up here. I'm, yeah, I'm not going to go there. Well, one of the things that I really want to stress, and, and this is my soapbox, is, and, and they still do it sometimes, like on your coach, you may see this. On the electric door, it may say uh, 240 volts, 50 amps. It is not 240 volts. 50 amp service is two 120 volt legs in phase. Two, 240 is out of phase. And if you put 240 into a coach, what it does is it runs 110 up the ground wire and 110 up the positive wire and it fries everything in your coach. So if you go over to a friend's house and right. he says, well, let's just plug it into my dryer outlet. <laughs> no, that costs you 10 grand. You don't want to do that. You have to be careful, and if you're not sure, neck it down to 30 amps and just stay on the 30 amp 110 side. Don't take a risk. Yeah, because everybody's dryer is, a, you know, their stove. Your Uncle Leroy that's got a welder out in the shop, that's 240 direct. That is, even though the plug looks the same, do not plug it in there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's 220, it's out of phase, it'll fry your cook. So the, the bottom line is, is you have this 50 amp service, it has two legs of 110 volts, 30 amp in phase. Because all they're doing is they're putting that 50 amps on two wires instead of one. If you, <coughs> excuse me, if you go into a motor campground that only has 30, well, you're just gonna lose your second side of your your electrical panel, but everything that you need, your microwave, you know, the refrigerator, your, your charging system is going to work just fine. Yeah. I have a 39 foot fifth wheel that's 50 amp. My best friend Steve has a 32 foot Arctic Fox that's we're all 50 amp. And just about every place we go is 30 only. And we have never, other than one summer, it was super hot. We'd only run one air conditioner. Other than that, we've never had an issue on there. So, do you have to have a different, like, an adapter plug for yep. 30? Yep. So, yeah. your four prong on our 50 amp plug won't work in the 30 amp part? No, it'll tie, it'll bring it down to three. three. So, I have to get something in here that yeah, fifteen works to a three yeah. and plug it in? Yep. Yeah. Okay. 50 30 adapter, yes, ma'am. All right. If I want to plug it in at the house, I need that $15, $50, $30? Um, that's a very good question. The young lady asked, what if I plug it into the 110 outlet in my house? Now, 
which the first is the thing is, the dryer. you're probably going to plug it into the garage or something, and that is most likely on a uh, reset, 15 amp, 20 amp reset. HDMI. No, what the heck? Come on. I don't know. I don't know where you're What do you call those? The reset? The GFI. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm old. Ground okay. fault indicated. So if you plug it into the GFI circuit on the side of your house, it will not work. The RV system sample that current just like the GFI, and if you plug into a GFI, it pops it immediately. So you need to go into a standard <coughs> excuse me, 110 outlet. Now, uh, we do sell, there are in the industry, 15, 50 to 30 and 30 to 15 adapters and 30 to 20. 30 to 15 is going to plug you right into the side of your house. And it, nothing wrong with that. But now you cannot use your air conditioner. You could probably use your microwave for a few minutes. But what it's going to give you, 15 amp service is going to give you charge for your batteries and let you run your refrigerator and, you know, a few lights. But you won't be able to use any of your major appliances on 110. You can't use your curling iron, you can't use your toaster, you can't Coffee use maker. your hair dryer. Uh, just, you'll, you'll fry the circuit, it's just not heavy duty enough. Would it be better to use the generator then? The what? The generator. I don't know, it depends on what you, how, how I mean, if you're at a friend's living. house, I mean, and they are at buddy's house? Hand. Uses free electricity. Okay. You can still run your, you, you know, you're going to flip your water heater to gas, your fridge to gas. Mm -hmm. All the thing you're going to need is for is keep your battery <coughs> charged, watch a little TV. Yeah. If you do want to run your uh, microwave or air conditioner because it gets hot, then unplug and start your generator. Okay. Do you guys have a generator in yours? I was just going to ask. Good. There's, there's other ways to deal with that issue. And then the reason I gave that face is on the on the gas generators, more so than the, the nice diesels, the gas generator is very inefficient. Very inefficient. If, if you want a portable generator, go buy a Yamaha like we sell or Honda or something. They're like five times as efficient. The they owning generators, they're noisy, they vibrate, and they're very fuel inefficient. If you started it and ran it for a day, you use up 15, 20 gallons of gas. Yeah, they, they consume about two and a half gallons an hour. Not a good thing. Where if you bought a little Yamaha to, you know, discharge your batteries or whatever, um, that Yamaha that we sold at 2000 is 1000 bucks. It runs for an hour on less than a half a, ta on a, half a gallon of gas. Extremely efficient and very, very clean power. Now, don't let him scare you out of running your generator. Because <coughs> it's a gas generator. The new fuels <coughs> are not good on generators, lawnmowers, weed eaters, anything. You need to run that generator a half hour every couple weeks to keep new fuel going through. Okay. And in case, if you do need to stop on the side of the road and heat a hot pocket or run the air conditioner <laughs> for an hour or two, for, for $4 worth of fuel, it's comfort. Yeah. So, All right. you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's comfort power. It's, okay. Now, with yes. generators, you can never run them too long. They won't run you out of gas. They have a pickup tube goes in the same fuel cell you get for your engine. The fuel pickup is higher than your engine pickup. So, if you're at a quarter of a tank, and, that's why that shuts and that off. generator will start, it's because you don't have enough fuel in your tank. And that's so you don't go up in the woods and right. run yourself out of fuel when they find you next spring. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's good information. Yeah. You notice if you get very many of these, there's a few things he and I don't 100% agree on. We don't disagree, okay. but uh, <laughs> it's just different points of view. Well, I mean, yeah, we don't disagree on it. I just, I, for comfort, I, I have a fifth wheel that has a $1,000 generator I carry around. Pain to load and unload and keep fueled. And if I had a generator in my fifth wheel, I'd run it every. I'd run it just as much as I did my portable, mm -hmm. and I'd pay the fifteen or twenty bucks extra for fuel just to reach over and hit the button and be done. Okay. Yeah. So um, we're going to move on to charging systems, and then we can 
let him start talking about food. Um, it's well, in his contract. He, he gets to talk about it every day. Every yeah, every it's the only reason I show up. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you guys all have newer coaches. So the, 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 the big conversation we usually have when we have a big crowd and, uh, is the older coaches have uh, feral resident converters <coughs> excuse me, that are taper charged. And when they fully charge the battery in, in the coach, if you keep them plugged in, they just keep going. Click, click, click. After about two weeks, there's about 17, 18 volts of the battery. That thing is fatter than me and, and leaking all over everything, and you know, that's not good. Now, the newer ones, <coughs> excuse me. You mean get you a water? I got some stuff. Screwdriver? I, um, I just need to take out the chop. <laughs> My wife won't do it. I don't understand that. So the newer ones all have three-step or better uh, converters that do a bulk charge, and then they do a float, and then they shut down. So if you plug your coach in, you're not going to use it for a few weeks. And you plug it into the side of your house with a 15 amp outlet and everything, it's just sailing along. And you come back three weeks later, the converter will have fully charged the batteries and then it will have shut down so it didn't overcharge. If you had a 1970, I think we had an 82 Terry 50. We, we wore that thing out with our kids, oh my goodness. Anyway, it had the old style. And if you left it plugged in for more than about 12 hours, those batteries were toast. So, you don't have to worry about that, but people say, well, you know, I just start my generator for a couple hours and it charges the batteries just fine. Two things, the generator doesn't charge anything. It powers that converter. <coughs> Excuse me, the other thing is the amount of power that takes for that generator to start takes that converter about two hours to put back into the batteries. So if you're out somewhere and you start your generator, you're not even really charging the battery for the first two hours. You're replacing what you took out of it. So you're looking at six to eight hours to do a decent recovery. So um, the same with the, if you have a portable. If you plug that portable generator in, one of the things it's going to do is power your converter if your converter is putting out 30 amps per hour, you have two batteries, and let's say they're 100 amps, and they're all the way down, that's 200 amp hours you have to put back in. 30 going into 200 is beyond my math, but, uh, you know, it's about eight, nine hours. It takes quite a while to fully charge those things. However, again, if you're up Diamond Lake elk hunting or fishing, <coughs> and you've run your batteries down over the night, running your heater and all that, Run it for eight hours. Run it for eight or nine or ten hours, that generator. It's what it's built for. And yeah, it might be a little noisy, but in the middle of the night, the next night, after you've fished or hunted all day, your batteries and heater are still going to be working. You may have to do that every day. But what that allows you is TV and heat and hot water. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's all, it's what you want to do. You can use candles and play cards and not watch TV and heat your water on the stove and not have to run your generator as much or use it as an RV and enjoy the heck out of it. I do. I can't. I, I fought buying a big RV for years and after I did, I was like, man, I should have had one of these a long time ago. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. No, I keep no, interrupting. No, no. You, you, you're, you're doing fine. Um, Last thing, I, I really don't have anything more on that. I just wanted to talk about this before he gets into poop really quick. Uh, because once he's gone, he's he got there. So um, you were talking earlier about needing to know about you know, drying your coach out. When we're in that coach, uh, when we exhale, there's moisture, we sweat. When we cook, for every gallon of propane that you burn on the stove, a third of that's converted into water. So if you cook for a couple hours, you just put half a gallon of water into the system. So 
Number one, these are assault type, and so are these. I don't know where you hit them. These are my favorite. Yeah, and that's why I give them to him. I'm old school because I'm a cheap man. And these <laughs> work really cheap. They're, they're assault bright. They're a dry crystal. You put them in here, they absorb the water and they drip down into the bottom and then you just throw this, it's uh, potassium salt. Um, works good, it's cheap. Except when you're full timer, you can't drive around with those because they slosh all over the floor and everything. So these just hang, you hang off uh, wherever in, yeah. in your unit. It's all the water sealed in it. Once it gets full, you just toss it in the garbage and hang another one up. We're not here to try and sell you anything. Right. We've already done a good job of that, I guess. <laughs> Would one of those work for the whole coach, or do you no, have to place them around the coach? Bedroom, bathroom, and living area, mostly around the kitchen. All I did with mine was one in the bedroom, and one in the living area. Okay. And they are. They're this this little box. I'm not saying I'm not saying not to buy it here, but uh, oh, I'm parts lady back there. <laughs> It, you you will find as you start using stuff where the most inexpensive place to purchase that is Home right. Depot. Um, I use these a lot, so they're they're just handy. They are a little more, but when I had my trailer and we weren't living in it, and it just set up next to the house four months of the year. Those were fine. I just had to remember to take that out and set it next to the garage before we took off. But yes, for as you're sleeping at night. Two people are going to burn out. Two quarts of water is going to come out of your body, body through your mouth and attach itself to anything cool, which is usually the roof or the side walls in the slide room you're in or the bedroom. And we get calls every week. Oh, we have huge leaks. There's water dripping down the walls. Dripping down the walls or in one spot? Well, the walls are all damp. You need to open some windows. You need to open yeah. some vents. You need to get some air movement. People, believe it or not, a dog, a 75 pound dog will put off more than a human. They breathe so fast. They drink a lot more. And we get people with two dogs and two of them, and we get the call, and it's hard to explain to people. And at first, they don't believe us. We just don't want to work on their unit. No, drive the 70 miles here, and we'll check it. But, yeah. and, and with that, I don't see them up here, but. And on my unit, every day of the year, I leave a couple of my vents cracked. One in the bedroom, one in the front room. And that's with the max air covers. We do sell max air vents that go over the top. That's what they suggested yesterday when we had to get in service. They said if you have this installed, then you can use it during any weather at all. That right. And a lot of these states, you know, spring and fall, we have 65, 75 degree days that are nice days, but it's raining or drizzling. When you open your vent, you can't use that vent. Correct. And uh, they're nice to have just even over the bathroom, just so you can leave the bathroom vent cracked a little bit. We just made the decision we're going to have them installed. Yeah, they're they're worth it. I put them on every. I had a little trailer, a little elk hunt trailer, that was not much more than a hard wool tent. But even in that, I had those on it. So yeah, moisture is a big thing. We, we see coaches where moisture people live in full time. And within a year and a half, the walls are starting to rot. You know, they just, they won't get it aired out. Sorry. Why? Well, you know, you did, I was going to bring up uh, the Max Harris, but you did that. That was my whole. Oh, order. I stole one of your things from you. Wow. <laughs> Made your day. <laughs> No, it, it's all good. It's all you. It's your turn. Are we going to plumbing systems? We are. It's time. I gave you, you one of these. What five months since we've done this? We used to call this something different, but we had to stop. Yeah. <laughs> no, we used to call it. About that. <laughs> your wife has a dirty mind. <laughs> we used to call it. But we are talking we about it. Yeah, we, we used are. to have a different name, but somebody. That saw us live stream. Apparently, they use that somewhere in some other state. So it's one of those trade trademarks. <laughs> Everybody's all concerned that somebody might have something you have. So plumbing, water tanks, and water pumps. Yeah, we'll get Ted with you. <laughs> uh, 
you're going to have basically the same thing in a fifth wheel in an RV. A water pump system or city water. Um, I'll kind of draw, I did not, I was not the best in art class, so uh, you'll hear people say city water or water pump. Oh, I'm being critiqued by one of our technicians back there. <laughs> You're going to have your side of your coach. You're going to have this tube that goes in, more than likely on yours. Yours may be She's got the valve. Okay. Down to your fresh tank. And that's where you're going to put your hose to fill your fresh tank. She's going to have a valve. You might have a valve. Baystar have a valve, Randy, to fill fresh or city fresh? Okay, then disregard this. You guys are going to hook up your hose to the side of your unit. You're going to have a valve that says city fill or regular usage tank. I have to turn the pump on and hit the valve to the tank and then it fills it from there. Yes. And you hit the tank and turn the I pump have on. I have the pump on to do the tank. What's that? No, you shouldn't have to have the pump on. Well, it wouldn't. It, it would, was it just slower? I mean, it fills it fast with the pump on there, but does it burn out the pump if I use the pump while I fill it fresh water? No. No, the, your, your city fill is ahead of the pump, so having the pump on should make no difference. Because <coughs> the city fill is straight up and down. Tank fill is off to the left. But I did it yesterday. I went to fill the tank without the pump on. I couldn't hear any water going into the tank. Hit the pump, water started blowing into the tank. I mean, I filled it Is back. that right, Randy? No. Yeah, pumps off. Yeah, because you're 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 where you're filling. If your pumps here, put that on your list, and we'll look at it. If your pumps, if your pump is here and your tank is here, right? I'm gonna make you work. This goes up to your. This goes up to your faucet. Right. Your city fill is on this side. Right. Of your pump. So that when you're filling, it goes this direction into your tank. So having the pump on, all that's doing is giving you false pressure up to your okay. water stuff. Because I couldn't hear any water going into the fresh well, tank. A lot of times you won't up. hear. Okay. Depending right. on where your elbows and stuff are, you may but not. But when I turned, put the pump on, boy, you could hear the water well, filling into that tank. You may just be hearing rattling from the pump too. Okay. All right. But I think also if you hear that pump, it's in that loop. Doesn't it through the loop if you turn the pump on when it's in on um, no? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wouldn't sorry. this wouldn't this pump yeah. shut off because that's feeding? Well, when you're filling the fresh water tank in the valve, it fills the bottom of the tank. Yeah. And it fills it up to more water. Okay. Alright. Yeah, you won't. We'll look well, at I, it. Well I won't hit the pump anymore then. Yeah. yeah, we can take a look at it. Yeah, we'll look yeah, at it. Yeah, you're, you're always filling on the downward side of the okay. pump. Alright. That's why we get a lot of people that say, oh, I, I left it plugged into city water, and uh, my tank filled up. Well, the, okay, I'm back this year. <coughs> Anyways, if, if your tank starts filling up while you're just plugged into city water, you've got some valves wrong in your pump. You should not be able to, uh, if you're running off the pump, then it's going backwards. Okay. You shouldn't have to worry about well, that. If somebody for can years. just check it and verify it, then yeah. you know, yeah. we'll answer that question. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Okay. That way we know. That way we know. Now, black and gray tanks. Happy Camper. It's made in Oregon. It's not made in China uh, or Japan. You don't have to pay a tariff on it. The, uh, the best part of this is the chemicals. A lot of the stuff we were getting for years, uh, you can put a scoop of it in the pond to kill every fish in there. This stuff does not use much of formaldehyde and weird chemicals. Uh, the only thing that does make this ineffective is if you use, if you're big on antibacterial hand soap. If you're big on that or antibacterial anything, this is a bacteria. So you put this down in your tank, wash your hands six or eight times, and you successfully killed everything in there. So bacteria is a good thing, believe it or not, even to human beings. We've antibacterial ourselves almost to death in America. So, uh, 
going off of one of my rants. You're doing good. It's important. I'm trying not to. I, I believe that there's reasons that other countries are in better health because they don't use all this antibacterial stuff all the time. So black and gray tanks. The gray tank will get just as dirty and stuff just as bad as the black tank. They get the, the, the oils out of your skins, your hair, uh, the, your galley. Uh, black or gray, if you have two different grays, you're going to have a bath and a galley. If you have one, they're going in the same area. So that chunk of rice aroni, that little chunk of cottage cheese, it all goes right down into your gray tank. So that gray tank needs to have that in it also. There's directions in there how to mix that in. He likes to put it in a five gallon bucket, stir it up until it dissolves, pour it down the I usually just put it in my sink, fill my sink, stir it around, just wash it down, fill up my toilet bowl, use my toilet scrub brush to and run it down. You're going to want to run about three or four toilet bowls full of water down your toilet after you dump to preload your tank. That gives you a little moisture at the bottom so that when that solid hits, it doesn't just go plop and start stacking up and it start work its way out. So preload your tanks. Agreed? Absolutely. That's why I use a bucket. I, I use my cap bucket and that puts about three gallons of water in there to slosh you around. You know you've got the proper and, yeah, I'm sorry? You know you've got the proper amount of liquid going into it. So right. Put it, but, yeah. Just yeah. put it in there, fill it, dump it down the toilet and and, and this this is an enzyme, so if you introduce it into the holding tanks It'll actually grow and, and, and thrive. So after you get started, you don't have to use quite as much, but you use it consistently, and it'll actually digest the beta cellulose, the paper, the tissue, and the organic material. I put it in my septic tank. That's what it was originally yeah. designed for. Yeah. I didn't know you had to put it in the gray tank, though, so that's good. Yeah, they get stinky. Yeah. They get mad. So, while we're, while we're on gray and black, if you're gonna be full time in somewhere or camping, don't let your buddy or neighbor tell you, oh, while well, you're hooked up there for the week, just pull your tank valves and let your waste drain out. No, because what will happen is that waste in your toilet that you just flushed is gonna hit the bottom. The liquid's going to run off real quick out the hole and solids are gonna sit there. We get full-timers that stay in an RV camp for a year or two. We get a call from them about 60 days in, mad at us because they can't flush their toilet. Uh, the toilet is completely full with nothing but poop and toilet paper, no liquids. Sometimes we can get that moistened up by using this and some tools and get it out. Usually the technician that might have made me mad earlier in the day gets that job. I can't say that he's hurt me. So there's a valve on there that you can spray sure. water into those tanks. Yeah, we're going to go over that valve too. That's one of my big pet peeves, okay. are those black tank flushes. The right. best way to flush your tank is to keep it filled. Get the pressure behind it. Even if you've only camped for two days and you have a third of the tank, before you drive out of there to take it home or to wherever the campground's going to dump it. Stand in there, put your foot on the foot feet. Stand there for 10 minutes and let that black tank fill up. Then, when you pull out of the camp spot and you're heading down around the corner there to the free dump, you're going to look like you're a little drunk going down through the campground. You're going to get that <coughs> slosh in and get everything moving. Then when you get there, you're going to open it, and you're going to have 70 gallons of pressure behind it rather than 20, and it's just going to shoot that stuff out of there. Now, if there's going to be behind you and you have time, you shut those valves, go back in, stand there for three or four minutes, put another 20 gallons in there, go back out and run the fresh water through it. Then you do your gray, because even though gray stinks and is dirty, it's cleaner than poop. So you use it to rinse out your sewer hose. Most places have a hose where then you can attach, detach your hose, rinse it out, put it away. But yeah, don't ever keep that valve open. You want it closed. You want that pressure. You want it to build up. So, 
Another thing that happens is, I'm glad you're here because I wasn't going to be able to use my spiel today on poop. Because you and you have electronic sensors on your black tanks. You don't have probes, you have an electronic sensor that reads resistance through the tank. You will have probes. So, not a bad thing, because you're here, you're going to learn how to keep track of those. Let me say this is a black tank now. It's got this uh, toilet. That's not a bad looking toilet. You got this toilet on it. It's one of those porcelain ones, I can tell. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, boy. Yeah. You have these probes that are literally. <coughs> that's about how big they are sticking into the tank. So you're going to have these on there. You're going to have a third. Let's go up here. Let's go full. And another one here. You're going to have wires that come all off those this thing called a resistor and that reads resistance on these probes so when there's nothing touching this probe it reads zero resistance and it shows it open as soon as you start using it your waste gets up here and it shows resistance so that light comes on that's when you're pushing that and it shows your light so what happens is you've owned this for a while you Unless you once a year do a complete flush and wash, which is repeating, filling it, draining it, filling it, draining it four or five times, you're always going to have a little bit of stuff left in there. So what happens is you can't dump at the campground. you got to drive back to Holmes or somewhere to dump it. You're going to have this little dude up here floating around in there. And you're going to take the corner, and this thing's going to fly over here and stick right on this probe look like that and what you successfully done is harpoon the poop <laughs> <laughs> you harpoon it right there it's stuck so, now so you get home you dump the tank he's registering it's there all the time <laughs> yes he does live for that thank you My, <laughs> you live to say harpoon the poop harpoon the poop and i should have known that technicality i've heard it too many times you have it's a, it's I think tell you he actually has a YouTube right. video on that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> even even after you've drained all the liquid out, you're going to have this little dude sitting up there on there, and it's going to read that resistance. Well, it doesn't just light that one up. It lights this one, this one, and that one. So you're going to call me and say, Dan, I've owned this six months. There's something wrong with my black tank. It reads three quarters full. You need to fix it. Dan's going to try to talk you into using some happy camper and flushing it and letting it sit for three or four days with happy camper try to get that probe cleaned off. And you're going to be so, I'm not saying you are, usually this is really good with 60 people, because you're going to be so sure it's everybody's fault but yours, that you want it down here and you want it fixed. So you bring it in and Dan says, well you do know that if we get that fixed, it's not an actual broken component, warranty's not going to cover it, and it's $130 an hour. But you're so sure there's not a little dude hanging on there, you say, that's fine. So then I pay a guy two hours to go in there and stand there and flush and unflush your toilet and add water and do this and that and drive it around the block and slosh it. And he gets this little dude worked off and it shows empty. Then Dan calls you and says, well, come pick it up. You owe us $260. And then you're mad at Dan, which is fine because you don't know me yet. That's why I'm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So, take the opportunity to, probes are very important to keep clean, and Happy Camper will do that. You guys sell some packet of something that's supposed to clean your probes. Well, yeah, we have stuff up there, Thetford sells some stuff called probe cleaner and stuff. Yeah. Is this here's, that, that'll work too. Okay. <coughs> that's the best stuff. Okay. And the best thing you can do is, it's hard to when you're living it full time, but once a year, Fill your black tank clear up, mix a bunch of that in there, and just let it sit for a week. Just let it sit there and just cook on that stuff. Not and that, take uh, it and dump it. Not that, excuse me, not that we're conspiracy theorists, but certain Chinese governments sometimes will make chemicals, and this was actually proven in our it, industry. It was. They will sell chemicals, that provides their chemicals from uh, China. 
And every country has a problem getting rid of biological waste. And they slip in a few parts per thousand. But if you're making 5,000 gallons of something, well, you could get rid of a couple hundred gallons of some extremely top toxic chemical and slough it off in this. So I, I have to be careful about that. But my point is, is we need to make sure we are cognizant of what we're buying. And Thetford makes a good toilet. Yeah. We, we don't argue that. They're very good toilets. I would never buy any of their chemical because it's made in China. Um, this is a good... In America, obviously, we're not going to contaminate our own chemistry. So, it, it's just a thought. But it's, it's, it's a proven fact. And, and some people, they, they, they think it's more like designer coffee. Well, I like this. Well, I like the smell of this. But you got to know what you're putting in the ground. So, with that, I'm done. I just wanted to say that. Um, and everywhere you go camping, there's gonna, you're going to meet a group of people, and he's going to tell you where he uses dish, uh, automatic dishwasher detergent. The next guy's going to tell you where he uses Dove laundry detergent and hydrogen peroxide. And my grandpa will tell you this. And in this industry, we do a lot of work on black and gray tanks, and a lot of toilet work. And that makes the smell go away, and it works. If there was something better out there, I don't care if it was made in Liberia. If it worked better than that, we would be using it. So, if you do impact your black tank and we can't get it cleaned out, then Dan's going to call you and say, hey, guess what? That black tank's $500. It's $150 shipping to get it here. And we're not sure how much it's going to cost to get rid of your old black tank because it's hazardous waste at this time. We have to pay by the pound, and so several thousand dollars. We put a new tank in. We instruct you what happened, what went wrong. Most of the time, we do these. It's not one of our customers. It was one that bought it from a private party. Didn't know the difference. We do, believe it or not, we do a lot of walkthroughs here where people call and they say, "I just bought this from Off Craigslist. I don't know anything about it." We tell them, bring it in, we are going to charge you, however, we'll give you a walkthrough just like you purchased it from us, and we'll go over all the batteries, the black tanks, the, so that it's worth three or four hundred bucks to know what you're doing. If, if you're kind of done talking about poop for a minute, I, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get a little more coffee since, yeah, okay. since we have such a nice quaint get together. <laughs> So, I don't know where I know you guys from, but I know you from somewhere. Sorry. Really? Hi, you. You're not local. No, we, well, we just moved to Oregon in September. From where? North Carolina. I've been there a lot, but I've probably not seen it. Hillsboro, Durham, Chapel Hill area. Uh, Rockingham. So while he's over there getting his life with uh, on the same conversation, uh, when, I, when I was in college, I needed a job. And so in the summertime, I got into the RV industry. And uh, the, the guy that owned this little place, oh, yeah, you're some smart engineering kid. Well, he, he taught me a lot of stuff. And, and uh, I was taking this organic chemistry class, and I was learning all of this stuff about uh, Toilet paper is beta cellulose, how they make paper and that. So the people ask all the time, that we sell toilet paper for like two or three dollars a roll? And they say, is there a difference between RV toilet paper and my Sherman's? And I tell them, what I was taught, and I thought it was very astute, is what the RV toilet paper is shooting for is dissolving because we don't want to build up a mat. When he's really going out poop, he, does, he, he draws his towel out of here where it's matted toilet paper and poop and matted toilet paper and poop. And it, it's, you got the short version. But it can get hard. I mean, it, it actually gets hard. Yeah. So anyway, we're looking for toilet paper that dissolves. 
So what you do is get a clean, empty mayonnaise jar, fill it with water, and get a couple of sheets of your Charmin, and put it in there and soak it, and set it for a couple of hours, put the lid on it, shake it up. If it turns milky water, that cellulose is released and let go, and it's dissolved, and it's just wonderful. You can use it. If it stays pretty much the way it is because it's cheap toilet paper and the strands of wood are long and big and you've got to have a tough butt to use it, it's probably not going to work in your RV. <coughs> so I just tell people if you have a toilet paper you prefer, see if it dissolves. Then if it does, use it. Um, we used for years the stuff that cost us. <coughs> They're, 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 I'm sorry, what? Oh, that was my question. <coughs> you know about the um, that's what we used, and we used it for years. It was never a problem. And there's there's a couple of them out there. It's the better quality stuff where the, the strands of, of, of wood fiber are much smaller. You get a soft <coughs> cushion, and the print that they put in there is for structure. And if it, if it isn't too much in that stuff, if it'll dissolve and come apart, that's good toilet paper. You don't need to buy ours. Uh, the stuff that Thetford makes is, is just to the nth degree. You know, they're, they're, the print they stamp in there comes apart easily and they dissolve easy. But that's all we're looking for. So try your own toilet paper. You know, make a big deal out of it. Have fun with it, you know. And if you add enough water with it, keep the pressure up, keep it high, it should find its way out of that hole. But didn't you guys say one time, maybe I dreamt this, no cotton now because it's made of cotton fibers? Well, there are some heavy duty brands that are, you get that triple applied Charmin that you take about two chunks off and it's about that big. <laughs> that, it, it can get a little big. I mean, it, it can get, buy a nice mid range toilet paper. I use Scott. That's what it is. What I've used, Scott. Scott. Uh, 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 Scott, and basically, I think Kirk, I think Scott makes the Kirkland brand. But yeah, I I haven't had any issues. I just use chemical, and make sure I have plenty of liquid. Again, and, and don't be afraid. If you know you're only going to be there two days, you're not going to fill up that toilet. I lived in my fifth wheel for a you year. You guys are enjoying this way too much. Yeah. I lived in my fifth wheel for a year or so. And it took my wife and I exactly seven days to fill. We knew exactly how long we had to fill that black tank. Seven days. Every Sunday is when we ended. It only took us about three months to figure that out. A year and eight months into our full time experience, we had to figure it out. We were only full time because we were in between houses. Bit. So you said you only dumped the, the black paint every seven days? It was one, almost, almost like clockwork. Every Saturday morning, I mean, you yeah. get <coughs> just me and my wife. And everybody's black tank's a different size, too, depending on what you're in. Yeah. He always cracks me up because he says, I take my five-gallon bucket and I, you know, mix my happy camper and dump it in. Well, we've got some little b vans with like seven gallon black tanks. Right. <laughs> so I can just see him through. Oh, it's full. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, I can take it. <laughs> it's all right. <coughs> Any questions thing? on black tanks, great tanks, fresh tanks? So, fresh tank. So this this water thing that sprays in there that you put the water thing that sprays in is you're going to have one too. Rated. Called the black tank flush. Right. Basically, what it is. You want some more pictures? Can I make a comment before you start the whole? Yeah, thing? please do. Don't screw into it and leave it on for a long period of time because it fills everything in the coach and comes out the toilet. Just oh, so yeah. you know, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> yeah. You guys have got a file on me already on that one. Uh oh, so. I, I think I've heard about this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have. Okay, so you're going to have your black tank. And this is the side of your coach. Somewhere in the side of that black tank is going to go this thing that looks... I know it's a turd, right? It actually, the actual size is probably that wide. That's probably actual size. And this is the side of your black tank. So right there. <coughs> What they've done is added some plumbing to that, 
So then over here on the side of your fifth wheel or trailer or motorhome, you can hook the garden hose up and spray water into your tank. The problem is, more than likely, the probes are on the same side of the tank. This little dude right here has got about 200 holes drilled in it. So they're like little squirt guns. You hook that hose up and turn it all full blast. It's a nice little mist in there. It's like a rainbow of water. Going. It's like a rainbow of water going in there. What it's not doing is rainbowing on your probes. And what it's not doing is supplying enough pressure to blow anything that's lodged over here out. Okay. I thought it was shooting straight out and it was swirling no. maybe in there, but it's not doing it. No, it's just looks like a little sprinkler. It looks so is that, you know, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a sales op. It's okay. something that, look what we have. Okay, so it's better to do the from the top with the toilet and draining the toilet into it to create more. You are pressure. actually add water and get full pressure. Okay. What'll suck what'll suck this out here is if you start with this much water and you open this valve, this great big black right. pipe that comes out, you got your black hose connected. You pull that knife valve, that water is going to come from here, which works. It's, it's going to start here, the highest pressure is going to be right here, and it's going to slowly start sucking this stuff this so way. It will loosen that up in that corner. Yeah. Okay. What's the little thing at the bottom? The little. That's from Rhino. It's supposed to be a. We bought. <laughs> it looks like looks the end of right a there. sewer hose. But it has a hose valve, a water hose valve that goes on it. Yeah, I didn't. It's it's about this long, and it you would put your sewer hose on one end and connect it to the exit yep. thing on there. But okay. then there's also another valve on there that you you would screw a hose into. Yes, and that's one of my big things because living in it, they make one of these, and then you can actually. Put this is a this is a black valve right that you put on the end where you hook up your where you would hook up your sewer hose you put this in line so you can watch it a little big on watching food it's important it is yeah I bet you we make a million I bet you we make a lot of Money every year <laughs> on black tanks. Yeah. yeah. So you can put this in line on your sewer hose. And get this the right direction. This is important to me. This is what you have coming out the end of right. your. Yeah. You're gonna put this in line. They sell where you can shut the valve. Or excuse me where you can hook a, a garden hose up to it. Correct. It forces, it would go right in here. So you can shut your black valve, hook a hose to it, and actually flush this tank from this direction, which actually does help. Plus this water coming in is agitated. And it's a lot easier just to have your wife or girlfriend or whoever upstairs watching in the toilet, because you have to have somebody there. Because if not, it'll go clear to the roof. And have her say, okay, I can see it. Because you'll see it coming up the toilet tube. And then as soon as she says that, you just pull that valve. And you've got all 50, 60, 70 gallons of pressure coming out. Then you close it. She stands there another 8 to 10 minutes. Okay, I see it. You could, within an hour, you could dump, wash your tank three, four, five times. And you can see when you're getting clean, because you'll start to see just, yeah, you see first you'll stuff. see yeah. all sorts of stuff coming out, and then you'll see chocolate milk, then you'll see 1% chocolate milk, and then you'll see... I'm this, eating. Oh. It's a cold, <laughs> it's, cold it's rough. Yeah. Yeah. And once it starts coming out clean, you're good. So that hose thing does really work good on that. It does. All right. Okay. If you put a knife valve in front of it so you can close it off. If not, so you have the water you 
Huh? You have to have the closed valve on. You have to have a closed valve. And you can't use the one that's on the regular tank. No, because then you're stopping the water from going into the tank. So you wouldn't leave that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, because if you left that, that open, open, it would just be running right back out. Right back out of you. I you got have it. to be able to shut it off now. So that'll right. be behind that. Behind that. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah, one of my favorite things I ever... We have them laying around the shop in all the bays. They work that good. Right. Well, we've got most of it. I don't have that valve yet, so I'll pick up the valve. Yeah, they work real nice. All right. If you're going to buy a, a sewer hose, buy a good... You sound like you have rhino. Buy a good... There's good ones out there. It doesn't have to be from us. It doesn't have to be Rhino, but there's definitely good brands and there's definitely well, not good brands. This is what we have right here. This is a decent brand. What I use. Okay. I have so, two so of these. question on adding all those pieces together. I call it the choo-choo train effect. You're adding this to this to this. Does it weaken and start to leak out any of those joints anywhere? If they're, if they're put on correctly? I've had mine three years if you keep care of them, if you take care of them, then I haven't had any problem. What is take care of The only problem I thing? have, take care of them is every now and again, see that little black O-ring right in there? Right. This is an extension. Actually, by the kid, it has the 90 degree elbow, right. which the parks are requiring if you stay in now. It has the whole deal. Yeah, that's what our Every now and again, I take a little bit of Vaseline or something and just rub on those just to just keep moisturize moist. that thing. Okay, all right. Rinse them out. Dragging them on the ground is about the only thing that will wear them out. If you're just taking that plastic. Every one of these little circles is a little piece of wire. Right. And it's like a dryer bed. And every time you drag it across the ground in the back of your truck, you're just... I have one. Some of these wires are showing, but I've never had a leak. I think mine's three years old. Cool. And even though they're, I don't know what they cost, if you get one that starts to leak, throw it out. Okay. Nothing worse yeah, than move on to that nothing worse than solid waste on your shoes. You can't buy enough duct tape. So yeah, you okay. can't. Right. I won't do it. Is it recommended that we fill our, uh, our fresh water tank before leaving home, rather than use what's at the state parks? Personal preference. Now, I can't remember where you are on this, but it seemed to me we kind of, this, this is my opinion, you do what you want. A lot of people don't haul it because they don't want to pay for the fuel to haul it. They know they're going somewhere that has water. So, they don't. I have wound up, I've camped enough, I've wound up where I've been heading somewhere with water. Went to uh, a nice, beautiful campground around here, right above Sweet Home, it's called Riverbed. Wound up there last summer uh, with water, completely full in my tank, and I hadn't been there an hour, and somebody ran off the road and hit a power pole down towards Lebanon, 30 miles away, whatever it is, and all weekend we had no power. Well, no power at that part, because it has a well, they had no water. So here I sit in my 39-foot fifth wheel, running my portable generator, watching TV, satellite going, taking hot showers. If I would have got there without water, I would have been stuck. So maybe not a full tank, but I always suggest you take enough. Even halfway there, you might want to stop and use the restroom in it, depending on how long your trip is. We went to hot August nights. So we stopped every hour or two just to get out. You know, make a sandwich, use the restroom. At least you have enough to use the restroom, wash your hands. Right. <clears throat> and you know, the weight, it's one of those things. It all comes down to dollars. Is it me? I fill mine up now. I keep it full. I do, if I don't use it, every month I drain it, sanitize my fresh tank. We'll go over that. And then I put fresh water in it so that you don't get a skunky smell or... Human, human fresh tanks can grow stuff in them. So, uh, I'll let him go over the whole procedure on that. But it's all personal preference on water. Okay. What about the filter system? Filter system, it, it all depends on where you're going to go and how filtered you want your water. If you're going to, the further south you go, the, well, I shouldn't say that, the water right here locally isn't great. 
but further south you go, you're going to have a lot more metals and particulates in your water. So I run the same filter that we sell out here. So those little inline filters just to stop the particulate stuff. And then at the kitchen faucet, I installed an actual uh, dual filter system just for if I wanted drinking water or cooking water, anything I want as pure as possible. As far as for showers, that outside filters great. As far as flushing toilets, washing hands, dishes, that's, that water's perfectly safe. Now, if I'm going to drink a glass of ice water, I want it filtered and then double filtered. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense because, I mean, our bodies get used to the geographic area where we live. Yeah. And you're drinking the water, and then if you go to another place where the water is different, it's going to have a physical effect on you. Yeah, it can. Whatever that degree is. Yeah, so. people that say the water doesn't taste or doesn't have a taste, they're wrong. I've been, I've worked in this industry, I've been all over the United States. Water tastes different depending on where you go. Question on, on the on the new Mars, it has it has a big filter yep. system on it. Is that filter system going just is it coming from the freshwater tank or the city or is, is everything going through that filter? It, everything you put into that coach goes through that filter. On yours. On yours. Every so any if your city water or tank. Any water that has entered that unit has been double filtered. It's a nice system. So is that filter system just for particulates or it is also no, for it's dirty charcoal things? and it's, it'll take out taste, colors, uh, it's so a dual should system. I, should we still get the, the kitchen filter that you were talking about? Yeah. If you want drinking water, if you have the dual, if you have the dual where there's two canisters, okay, if you have a single, it's a dual, it's a dual canister and a single, it's a single canister with a dual acting filter. She has two with separate. Oh, you only have one? It's just, I think there's just one big filter, that, but it's huge. Okay. Oh, yeah. It has a, a double acting, it's charcoal and particulate. Okay. So it'll take out. But with that, with, with those being on our coaches, would you still recommend to get the kitchen sink one too? It all depends on how clean you want your water at the kitchen sink. Okay. I, I, I don't drink a lot of water, but I cook with a lot of water and even though I boil it, it's just something about yep. okay. boiling my corn and water I don't know about. Okay. You know, I, I don't mind taking it, you know. So I, does the filter go underneath the sink? Or the extra you, filter, yes. Yeah. So you build it underneath We install it. We either, there's either a hole in your existing sink or we drill a hole and put in a filter or okay. we put in a separate just spigot. just a separate water spigot. Just a little separate water spigot. Separate okay. filter, it's an inline filter. And, and some just, of them just go on the cold line yeah. of that faucet. The yeah, some of them you can just do your regular, <clears throat> we can just put in line in the cold water, and it's just, it, it wears the filter out faster because you're putting more water to it. Right. Well, in a household, you can put a hot water spigot on your sink for like a cup of hot water, or you can do cold water. So yeah, we can do installs here too. If you want instant hot water, we've installed them. So before we take a break, I want to real quick just finish up the filters. <clears throat> the particulate filters, uh, they just get the big chunks out, and they'll last quite a while. But it sells, says on there to replace the filter at least once a year because, like Dave said, there's biology going on in that water, and filters are a good place for this to start growing. Now, in uh, most situations, you'll have a particulate filter that gets the big chunks out. And a lot of people use the portables. We put that at the hose bib, and then it, it filters and everything out all into the coach. And then a lot of people will put a, a finer filter under the sink. But those finer soap filters, depending on how bad the water is, they can plug up in, in two or three or four months. So you need to, as soon as you notice that your water flow in your kitchen is dropped, put a new filter in it. <coughs> and every fall when you're done, take that filter out and throw it away. Before you do, come down and match it up to your RV dealer to get the exact one back in again because 
over the winter you'll forget which one you've got. But you need to get those replaced and you don't want to just leave them in the system because they they are a culture center for bacteria. You, you read that you should have a few of them on board yep. as yeah. you're traveling. Absolutely. That you way know. there, if you go to some place that has a lot of bad well, you get out into uh, in water, it's going to go through. Like New that. Mexico, yeah. Three or four weeks. Southern California. So add two or three of those and just have them in your service. Yeah. Plus, well, you always find you always find yourself where you need one and you don't know the area. Right. So who, where do I go to get it? RV. Yeah. Yeah, and they're not that heavy. All right. Cool. Any study these a pressure reducer from the hose line? I'm sorry. Like it. Pressure reducer. Pressure reducer. That, that's something that we regulate. I, I so would, water depending on, right, right. Water depending pressure on, right yeah, depending on where you're heading, yes. I know every place I go, so I know, but that's my point, I take that chance. But I go to the same 15 campgrounds that I know we've never had an issue, won't. That if you're going to, if you're going to go what I call great camping but off-grid, I've got a tough suite on the you're way up in the middle of nowhere, but they've got good water pressure, good power, unless somebody gets cold. Uh, you know, it's a really luxury, nice, woodsy campground. Never had an issue there. But that same campground in Idaho or Colorado, who knows what their pump's doing, who knows what their city pressure's doing. We and our plumbing's come a long way now, too. Our plumbing's a lot tougher than it used to be. You know, we're using household pecs, good quality plumbing. We used to have copper and CPVC and you could you could do a lot of damage that a lot more resilient now. Our systems will are are rated for a have constant use of 80 psi. Our campground, uh, the city has it set at 69 psi. It's a little much but it's on the high end but we like it there. That way you can take a decent shower and that but uh, like Dave said, once you get to know your campgrounds, you, you don't really need one. Uh, do, but do you ask the campground where it's set? Yeah. Where's your water set? Yeah, Absolutely. Okay. It's a single well. well we, we bought, be we bought one even. We're staying out here at the park right here. And, if you have and one, we you bought know. one just to get in the habit of having it wherever yeah. we're going to go. Nothing wrong with habit on being safe. Okay. Yeah. I never thought I would. 20 years ago, let's just do whatever we want, whenever we want, it'll all be okay. But now that I'm getting older, we've got to be safe. Okay. And it can range from 60 PSI to 80. 40 to 80. Yeah. 80. Most, the, the regulators are 40 to, to, to 55. And uh, yeah, this the has a campgrounds are anywhere from, depends on the day, the, the private campgrounds out in the end of the world, they have a generator, and so, in the morning, the pressure goes up to 80 or 90, and at night it's 15. So you know, it's it's a little tough. And, and if if all of us grandpas jump up at the same time in the morning and put <coughs> faucet on to make coffee, then it goes. Brr. All right, that makes sense. A lot safer now than it used to be. That's good. Want to take five minutes? Yeah, five or ten minutes, and we'll come back and. Appliances, I'm going to talk Any, about my part. Talk about yours. Does anybody have questions on your appliances, how they operate, why they operate? Uh, <laughs> you do. You, you mentioned earlier that they have an auto or a select source. I don't know if our cells are not. Okay. It has, it's dual source, but I don't know. If it's dual source, it's, it is auto. You will have gas, electric, and auto. Auto mode, basically all that states is, if you're plugged in, it will automatically go to electricity because it basically considers it your best option at that point. If you unplug, it tells that you've unplugged and switches to propane. So I, I run mine always on auto, that way I don't forget. That way if you're plugged in at the house, it's getting cold for you. You unplug the take off, it switches over to propane, which you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to travel with your propane refrigerator on. Your refrigerator should keep stuff frozen and cold for up to five hours. 
You notice he keeps looking at me, Biz. <laughs> well, because he knows I run with my propane on. I run with my fridge on. It doesn't blow out. It stays cold. Then law states you can't get caught with your propane or anything running. Uh, but it will auto-source. That way you don't forget and leave it on gas, take it home, plug it in, your gas runs out, and all your food goes bad. Yeah, so if you turn your propane off to travel, just hypothetically. Well, let me, let, me, let me state the law here real quick. Okay. If you have a... <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I, it, you, it is a law, and I, yeah. I agree with it. If you it, have a motorized vehicle, it has a frame-mounted tank. <coughs> and we have to be careful because the LP industry has different names for different things. If you have a frame-mounted tank, it is legal to operate appliances going down the road. Now, when you, that, that brings us to, he's going to tell you what a battery disconnect is for. But if you pull into a gas station or if you get on a ferry, you, any closed area, you have to turn your propane off. If you have a towed vehicle, it is against the law to operate that vehicle on a road with the LP system on because you have cylinders and portable cylinders are not as secure as a frame mounted tank. And that's 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 the criteria. If you turned off your propane, say on a frame mounted tank, yes. like the coaches have. Yes. Would the refrigerator draw from the house batteries? Well let me back up just a little bit here. We're missing something. A these refrigerators operate, they're called absorption refrigerant. So what they have is they have a heat exchanger tube that's about three feet to four feet long. At the bottom of it is a bulb that has a, a, either a heat element attached to the side or a flame underneath it. And when we were kids, the old RV refrigerators had a very small uh, bulb and so it was crucial to have that refrigerator perfectly vertical so that the flame did not go into the side and have heat fatigue failure. And then you get ammonia and, and sulfur all over. The way the manufacturers look at this, and this is why he and I have been making eyes for a while, is, is he, I look at it a little bit different. The way the manufacturer says to use your appliance is to pre-cool that appliance for 24 hours. 12 hours works just fine. So you turn it on one day, Maybe in the afternoon you get home from work. Tomorrow morning before you leave, you th throw your cold food in the refrigerator, you close the door, you turn the appliance off. Dometic and Norcold both say that if you do it that way, the refrigerator compartment will stay within three to five degrees for eight hours. Now, the 80 or 90 percent, I think it's 90, of the, it's been a long time since I did RV stuff. But, 80 to 90 percent of the cooling effort is in the freezer, and then it trickles down into the fridge. So if, if you pre-cool your appliance and drive for six or eight hours, when you get there, you set up, you plug it in, you turn it on, it'll recover itself, and it's the, the ice cream's still frozen, the beer's still pretty cold. Unless you went over a mountain pass, then it blew, and it's just all over the inside <laughs> of your coach. But the manufacturers want you to pre-cool it, fill it, turn it off, leave it for six or eight hours, and then turn it back on and let it recover overnight. Next day, turn it off, off you to go, and that's how they design their cabins. When you're driving down the road and the propane's on, that wind is blowing against that heat exchanger chimney, and it becomes very inefficient. Plus, the wind is blowing the flame out, and the igniter keeps relighting and relighting and relighting. We had a problem 10, 15 years ago where we were, a lot of people were driving like that and they were burning their igniters up. So I remember that, okay, it's probably 20, 30 years now, but we had, used to have a real problem with that. So I'm the advocate of do like the manufacturer says, pre-cool it and stay out of it. You know, if you, if you pull over for lunch, not a problem, but don't open it every five minutes, you know, just stay out of it. That's the right way to do it. So the conversation, the question is, well, what happens if I do it? It doesn't even come up. If you're talking to the Norco rep, 
and you say, well, how come I don't have a three-way anymore? Because we used to have 12-volt heat. It was maintenance only, very inefficient, and they saw that it was a huge load on the electrical system, so they stopped doing it. Plus, this inefficiency of the heat exchanger came into play again, and it, they just don't work. On the small appliance, uh, RVs, where they have the new generation compressors, um, they're a compressor type, and they have 12 volt and, and 110 compressors. It, it's a 12 volt compressor, but anyway, those you obviously can run down the road because they, they're not exposed to outside air. So, did that answer your question before yeah, you answered yeah, it? I, I, you know, it, it's just the do's and don'ts and what are the consequences if you yeah. do. That's basically what yeah. I'm asking. Yeah. If you're dry camping and you can't <coughs> walk around like a drunk sailor, you better level it up a little bit because it could be hard on your appliance. If you get around just fine, don't worry about it. Now, he has a different attitude on that. No, I say well, don't? everybody has their own. <laughs> everybody, I drive with mine on, but I, cause I've never had an issue. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'll be that guy that if I have an issue, I'll be like, man, I should have drove around with that on. The next meeting, yeah. you're going to change it up. All right. Good. So we, are we at the point of the meeting where we can talk about that hot water heater test? About yep. the, the what? Hot that, water heater. That, that thing? I saw that and I'm, I'm curious. I don't understand she what the answer is. Betty's got a question. Let her. But before we're refrig off refrigerators, I think I have a different refrigerator. Yep. Yes. And I figured out how to run the old one okay. Now i got to figure out how to run this one. Because it has no propane. Right. You just a household refrigerator. You go it's over to Silverleaf and turn it on and leave it on. So when you're driving down the road, it's running off of the inverter. Yeah. Yep. The bat or I'm going to say that wrong. No, you the batteries because it. it's powering up the inverter. So I'm but running off the you're batteries. As you driving, your alternator is charging your batteries, so you're basically just got big loop. But that's running off the house batteries. Yeah, yes. but the alternator in the engine, you actually have two alternators on that coach, and they are charging those batteries. So, yeah, this conversation house doesn't and apply to you. Okay. It charges house and chassis. Okay. So when you're driving, you're always getting a positive charge, and then your inverter is pulling that charge, making 110 volts. Your refrigerator is running off that 110, okay. which it's an LED fridge, probably a new. Yeah. Uh, it's an LED fridge, which is minuscule power. Okay. The new refrigerators, I can't believe you can keep stuff cool for yeah. well, there so today. I mean. Does it work the same then? I think that we kind of determined that if you're if you leave your coach sit during the summer and you're using it intermittently just to leave that refrigerator on so Absolutely. the compressor keeps as long as you're plugged in, yeah. As long as you're plugged in. But then what about this refrigerator? Is it the same thing? Am I going to want to keep it plugged in? Yeah, you have to because it's going to feed off your inverter. And if you're not plugged in, it's going to drain your batteries down. And you'll go out and that's going to be working. Well, I meant as opposed to turning it off completely. Oh, yeah. If you, no reason you can't leave it on. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay. If, if you find yourself leaving it for a month or somewhere where you can't plug it in, then yeah, I'd turn off fridge. And, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. You betcha. Sorry. No, you're good. It's going to be fun, I can tell. I already told her, get a hold of you. She, she had a fifth wheel, she was with me. Now she's got a motor home, she gets you. Yeah. It's okay, it'll be all right. <laughs> I'll try and be as good. So, anyway, um, I like these things. Uh, um, so we're talking about pro, uh, plumbing now, right? Life. Sure. You want me to go? You you get the you get the water the hot water here. So uh, before I go that I, we're, we're we're so totally Twitter painted today. We're not even close to our regular. Uh, one of the things that uh, we want to do is safety is a big thing. If you bought a coach from a private party. The state of Oregon requires that no matter where you buy it from, the seller has to do an LP system test. Now, obviously, we do, but 
usually there are 30 or 40 people here, and there's always a couple that bought it off Craigslist or something, and they, they really need to have a gas system checked because, like my house is gas, but it's never gone anywhere, and the, you know, it's a heavy uh, black iron pipe manifold gas system, it'll never be. Unless we have a big earthquake or something, but the RVs are moving constantly, so we want to have, even the people that bought it this year, a year from now, you need to have your LP system checked. Now, we offer, and I'm sure most dealers do, a spring tune-up. Once a year, we do it any time of the year, we just call it whatever, fall tune-up. But we do a spring tune-up, and one of the things we do is we check all your systems and we do a LP system test to make sure that the, the LP system is not leaking. Important, because, uh, you know, they, they can, that can cause a lot of problems. We had a leak this morning in here. That was interesting. So, I would recommend having that done. And the other thing is, is if you are new to this and you walk in your coach one time and you smell that essence of skunk oil, it's a chromal captain is what they put in there, skunk oil. That's to alert your senses that you have a gas leak. Now, we used to tell people, you know, open the windows, do this and that. They have found that propane will not pass through window screen. So, if you walk in your coach and you smell propane, don't turn anything on, don't turn anything off, turn around, walk out, and lock your door and screen door open. Go around and turn your propane off. And then go for a little walk around the neighborhood and say, hey, don't go smoking by my coach because I got a gas leak. Let it air out. You've turned the gas off. After 15, 20 minutes, you should be able to go back in there and you know, pack up and take it to the dealer and find out what the problem is. Used to be, we had people using their ovens a lot and they'd leave the pilot on the oven on and uh, you can check that and, you know, do a little checking. But uh, you want to make sure that you're safe with the propane. That little detector down on the floor is for propane. It senses that hydrocarbon because propane is heavier than, than the air. And the other sensor is up high. You'll, you'll have one, you'll have one. It's carbon monoxide from the generator. And uh, any RV with a engine, like if you have a fifth wheel and you are generator ready, it'll have a carbon monoxide detector. And it does the same thing. They last five, six, seven years, and then you need to replace If you don't contaminate them. We, well, get, we, get a lot of, we get a lot of contaminated with hairspray. <coughs> some people are over, I, I'm not going to say over clean, I mean, there's a clean, but when they're spanning the 409, on the bathroom counter, they spray the front of the cabinet and the floor, and that thing turns on and does a big sniff and catches all that chemical. That chemical just sticks right on the old sniffer. So it says, something's not right here, so we'll start beeping. So, okay. And everybody's seen the Blues Brothers, right? You know, they're in the elevator. Well, what that is, is that's the propellant in any one of these cans. It's propane. So that's why you're using your hairspray and everybody freaks out. They go, wah, wah, wah. that's because it's smelling that propane. So, yeah, you got to be careful with that. So anyway, now that I've said that, uh, I'm going to talk for two minutes more and then I'm going to let him do his appliance thing. This, is, this, this goes back to uh, what kind of water you're putting into your coach and why you use filters. It seems like the water heater is the low point and the bottom of the water heater is kind of a, a trough where even if you take the plug out, there's about an inch of water in there that doesn't drain out. And that's where all your hard water collects. And uh, I've worked on coaches when I was younger, picked a P-trap off, and it looked like this clear gravel crystalline stuff. That was hard water buildup, and it fills up your P-traps, and it gets into your water heater. So every year, every spring, when you sanitize your plumbing system because you, it's sat for six months and you want to get the bugs out, this little bug here, you take the drain plug out and you hook it up to the hose and you stick it in there and you turn it on and it just 
You don't stand here like this because it's going to get you. But you stand to the side and it'll blast out everything that's in the bottom of that tank and you'll have bam. And he's told stories in the past where guys would say, come and look at this. And they'd have a 10 foot ring of white junk that came out of your water here. Well, that's the stuff that you're drinking when you're brushing your teeth and you're taking a shower. So you want to get rid of that. And these tank rinsers really do a good job. And I get, uh, I get a buck for every one we sell. Usually when we have a big crew, I'll sell half a dozen of them. Yeah, well, it looks like something they, they that I well. definitely look into I getting my buck. I was going to say, I, I think it was paying you a buck. <laughs> It's deducted from your paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> so that's about all I know about RV appliances, and those are all my soap boxes. So I'm going to turn it back over to the boss, and he's going to tell you the real stuff. Aren't you? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so the water heater is the most important. That hard water will actually heat the bottom of your tank down. Same with house. It's just like a house. Uh, most people's water heaters have fell in their houses because the contaminants at the bottom of that water heater sit there and eat the bottom out. They're just big. I don't know if you ever noticed in your house that your water heater's got a, a faucet bib on it. <coughs> Every now and again, you need to run a garden hose in the house and open that as fast as you can. And you'd be surprised if it comes out of the bottom of your water heater. So, usually we'll get people that call in and they've only owned their coach a year or so and they say it smells like sulfur. It's, it, it smells like grandma's house she used to on the farm and they had sulfur in the well. And, you know, and usually it's because we're starting to get contaminants in the bottom of the water. So, keep yeah, it clean. Like six months or so? Huh? Every six months or so? Yeah, six months, once a year. That's one of those things you'll kind of, after you make your year around, you'll see how bad it is. You may decide you only do it, you do it every year and a half. You may do it after a year and say, holy smokes, I should probably do that once every three months. Just depending on where you're at. So, maintenance on refrigerators, except for your refrigerator. On the outside, you're going to have a refrigerator compartment, two little latches, you get in there and look. It's a nice warm spot. Great place for wasps, squirrels, chipmunks, anything, depending on where you're parked, likes that warm spot. We've actually taken uh, refrigerator compartments off where people said they're refrigerator would not ignite on propane and we pulled it off and had hazelnut shells just pour out and we found this little spot on the roof because there is an opening there's a roof vent for a refrigerator and all he can get up under there and all there is is a little thin aluminum screen if they chew their way through that aluminum they just drop down in they got a nice little cavity in there that stays about 80 degrees Sets him up a little nice little house on top of your refrigerator. Brings him in some hazelnuts and spends a couple weeks. And, uh, so you want to open that up quite often. Wipe it down. Make sure it looks clean. Don't be afraid. To, uh, everything in there is pretty much covered. Just kind of wipe it with a damp rag. Keep it clean. Water heater. Not a whole lot you can do with a water heater. Except open it up. Inspect. Make sure... Wasps haven't got in there. Great spot. Wasps love any of these openings. So your water heater, start checking it in the spring. Open the door. Make sure they haven't started growing house, building little houses in there. Um, the furnace, they'll do that on furnaces too. You have two holes. So nice little spot for them to get in. If you have a problem with ignition, sometimes they'll have gotten so far in and built such a big house, there's not enough airflow for ignition. Uh, they do make these things you put over the two holes, these cranes. They will void your warranty. Uh, they're great if you want to put them on while you're not using it, but when you're using it, you need to take it off. Because any amount of an obstruction trying to get that heat out cause overheating of a planet. Even though it's a screen and you can blow through it and the thing looks normal, that screen, no matter how narrow it is, there's enough of those screens, vertical and horizontal, that you're reducing the airflow. So I see people buy them and put them on and I see them using them camping and everything seems to be okay. 
It's not the best thing to do. That, that plenum in a furnace is designed to work at a certain temperature. If you overheat it, once it decides to shut off, it'll start cracking. And that's when you start getting the bad stuff in, they'll kill you. That's why they put the detector in there. So uh, every now and again, I take my, I look in there with the flashlights as far as I can, and I take my uh, air blower and blow it out. It's not all you can do. Um, that's about it on appliances as far as just keep it clean and wiped down. Yeah. Does my um, oven have a pilot light? Your oven has a pilot light. However, I was going to mention, I'm glad you brought that up because he was mentioning pilot lights. So some pilot lights years ago, you used to light them and they just stayed lit. And if you shut the door too hard or moved the pan too fast, the pilot light flame would go out. There was nothing to shut the propane off. Newer RVs, I'm going to say in the last 20 years, 18, I don't, 20, I don't know when that happened. they have thermal couples that they register that there's a flame on. If something should happen and that flame stops, the thermocouple shuts off the gas valve. So, my wife still does not like our oven having a pilot light on it. And it's just a personal thing. She doesn't like it on. However, I keep explaining it to her. If it blows out, the gas stops. Nothing will happen. She still just, she's pretty sure that bomb is going to go off any day now. Right. right in the middle of jeopardy. The whole kitchen is just going to disintegrate. But it won't. Uh, you, you know, those gas valves are designed, if something in the system does fail, the, auto, the, the automatic position for them to go is to the off position. So they're actually held open, not held closed, and then they fall open. It's the opposite direction. So very safe. So most of the time you have a leak, it's a man-made leak like a lot of people in the front of their stove will notice that wire that comes out and around the, your turn knobs. And it's where my wife hangs her kitchen towel. If you can put it there, it's not what it's for. It's so when you're in that tight little RV space, you don't walk by it or back into it and turn that knob on the front burner. Because it happens all the time. So most of the time people have to leak. The first thing we say when they call is, go check your stove. Probably 30% of the time they say, stove is on, burner got turned on a little bit. So that's what that's for. It does make a good towel open, but it's not what it's designed for. And that's, and behind you'll see usually there's a chunk of wood or quarry on a countertop with a bunch of slits in it. And everybody sticks their kitchen knives in it. That's an excellent knife rack. It's not actually, it's for that. It's for the venting, for the heat off of your oven come up through the back. It's just for airflow. That they they made these nice little slots in that pretty wood memorial under that knife. It's just that's where I keep mine. Okay, anything on more you know the best thing to do I notice on maintenance we, we talk about sealants. You always want to check your sealants. They're only warranted for 90 days. Sure, maybe somebody hasn't told you that, but from the day you buy it, I, I have to say this group has probably the best towable sold and the best motorhome sold are Newmar and Northwood. So I can't say they won't cover it for more than 90 days realistically because if we can show them that hey, this this seal looks like it might not have been done properly at the manufacturer, they're pretty good about covering it. We do have some manufacturers that are stocked on, they've had it for more than 90 days, it's their responsibility to keep an eye on their seals. So you want to check your roof seals, maybe, or, you know, just anywhere there's a sealant, you want to make sure it's not cracked, water's getting in, these things, they flex all day long when you're driving, they're flexing and rocking and expansion, the sun hitting this side, 40 degrees on that side, the sun hitting this side, you can't even touch the side of it. Everything expands cracks and sealants go bad. At least three or four times a year, we completely total out a rig that's only three to five years old just with water intrusion and rot. And usually you don't know it until it's too late. Usually it's that person that it's that person that only uses it six months out of the year. 
they used it all summer, they parked it uh, about September, and they go back out in May, open it up, and step through the floor, uh, notice the cabinet hanging, and the whole wall's rotten. I mean, it sits there moist for four, five, six months, and the materials just aren't made to sit there that long wet. And it doesn't take 130 bucks an hour and a bunch of cabinets and floors and tearing stuff apart. It doesn't take much to total out of it, you know, a unit. So you always want to be watching for water, leaks. We do clock. offer, huh? There's a certain kind of clock for sealant that you use for He'll tell you about the sealant because he's big on sealants. I will tell you if you're in the area, if you if you move to a different area, I know we offer it. If, if some place where you're at doesn't offer it, you should mention maybe they should. Um, we do a free roof inspection. We don't like it just everybody. We used to mention a free roof inspection with 60 people here on a Saturday. And Monday morning, 52 of them would show up at 8 o'clock. So we always say, if you want a free roof inspection, we'll be happy to help you out. Just call us and say, hey, when can I just drop in? And we'll go out, we'll take pictures and show it to you and say, everything looks good, come back in six months, or boy, it's good you got it in here. And we do that for obvious reasons. We're open uh, that if we do find something, either you can ask us how to fix it and we'll show you what to use and how to do it, or you may not want to get on the roof and you may say, hey, can you do this two or three hours work and get this all sealed up again? And a lot of the times, we're not noticing an actual leak. We're noticing something that in the very near future is going to leak. So we, we maintenance them pretty heavy. Do they pull the sealant out and then reseal it, or do they just seal it to the top? No, we try to clean as much of the old seal out as possible. We'll do whatever you want us to do. We've had people who have come in with a two-year-old Highline motorhome, and they'll pay five to $12,000 for a complete deal and seal which is a lot of hours to go around everything and try to remove 99% of the sealant on the roofs, the rails, the sides, windows, doors, awnings, and then we all completely redo it. So, or we've had guys come in with their hunting rig and they just say, we spend three or four hours and touch up what you see. And we'll do that for you. It takes longer to get the old stuff off than it does put the new stuff on. On a roof, that ceiling up there, you're going to want to keep an eye on it. Keep an eye on it for you. There's going to come a point where we're going to say we need to, something needs to happen, even touching it up. Something needs to happen pretty right away to most of it. So usually you can get away with once do what they call an overlay, which is cleaning all the sealants up there and putting new sealants over top of all that and running it wider. And it'll get you through until the next time. We'll only do that once. After that, we're going to let you know it's going to take 14, 15 hours for us to peel the old stuff, put the new stuff on at 300 bucks in parts. So we're going to let you know it's 2,000 bucks. That's two thousand dollars you'll ever spend is keeping that roof sealed. My tooth, my my fifth wheel, still you get a leak in an RV and you get a smell you won't get rid of. And it's not it's not that gray stuff. You know, it's not that black stuff no, I and mean, it's just a smell. So leaks leaks, you gotta keep water out of it. Okay, what was I going to talk about? You were going to talk about what type of sealant? Well, well, we're running a little bit long here, but I'll talk about it. Okay. You want me to talk about one, you talk about the other? Well, I don't mind talking about them. Okay. Just we're running a little long and they're starting to... Yeah, just we were supposed to be somewhere else to no. to get to the walkthrough. So oh, you're a piece of cake. We will, but just so yeah. you know, it's not because I know, right where you're too. headed, so you got plenty of time. Okay. So let's do this. Let's just answer real quick. On your roof, you're going to use... Dicor sealant. The reason he has me do this is because I like to explain why you want to use what you use. 
Excuse me, I'm a Jerry's guy. Spend too much money dirt. They sell a lot of staff and other sealants. But there's a chemical in here, it's called a carrier salt. That carrier solvent is what keeps this stuff flowing. When it is caulked out, evaporates. The carrier solvents are very critical to the substrate that you're applying it to. And the substrate in this will not react negatively to fiberglass or rubber or poly roofs. If you buy some DAP from uh, Jerry's and you caulk it out, you come back a half hour later, and what's happened is that that uh, carrier solvent has reacted with the, the membrane, and now you have cottage cheese. So it is imperative that you use the correct type of sealants. And Jerry's, as much as I love them, they don't sell them. And I'm not trying to get your money, I'm trying to save you a roof. If you take good care of your roof, you can stave off a replacement for 15, 20 years, but eventually you're going to have to put a new membrane on it. But it takes constant paint maintenance and, and a little bit here and a little bit there. You don't need to put much on, you just need to deal with the voids, the areas that are lifting up and flick off what you can and seal it. This is a uh, Dicor type product, that a butyl sealant. There are several different manufacturers out there. It's for this, uh, I got a degree in this, uh, ethylene polydimorphic rubber, EPDM rubber. That's I still can't what say this that. is for. So th the stuff that he's holding in his left hand is stuff that I've had in my toolbox for 30 years. Koch engineering, uh, parbond. It's for vertical surfaces. It's back in the 80s and the 70s, we had stick and tin trailers, and, and they would start rotting two days after they left the Terry plant in, in Eastern Oregon or like in Pendleton where the prowlers were built, they started leaking and rotting the week later. So I've been telling people for years, it doesn't really apply to any of you guys because the new stuff's good. But back then they didn't seal the seams and around the windows and that, and then water would just pour in. Now you have a little seam of that material that type of material around your uh, roof windows and your, your edges. And you just need to, along your belt line and that, you just need to look at it a couple times a year to make sure that you do it. And that's, this is the stuff I like. This is the stuff he uses most of the time. That's what we use. Um, this is what I vehicles. use. I keep this in my toolbox and in my fifth wheel. And the best time you'll do it, when you inspect your unit, the best is when you're camping, believe it or not. Because even though you're camping and having fun, you're always walking around it, and that's when you're, oh, what's that? A little, a little spot there, some water to get in. You run to your toolbox, psh, put a little of this on, rub it on. Next thing you know, you walk around, inspected the whole thing, touched up six or eight holes, and you feel good, you don't got water coming in. So I keep one handy. And this is, dude. When you're a drunk and high on the sewer, campground in Connecticut, if they say you use silicone, you shake your head yes and tell yourself no. <laughs> we don't use silicone. Not in Some our industry. Not in our industry. Okay, so let's do this then, since we're since we're going long here. See, we always go long with the smaller crowd because we answer, we get way more in depth. So what haven't we talked about you want to talk about since you have new rigs? She's going to get special treatment just because she lives close and she's going to be down here a lot. And, yeah. and I'm not smart. Not special treatment, just she is. She, she just lives down the street. So can you talk to about inverters and converters? I can, yeah. I don't know whether anybody else wants to What do you to want to know about, about inverter converters? What they do? Real easy. Inverter is going to take 100, an inverter is going to take 12 volt power out of your battery, run it into this box, and invert it into 110 volts, and send it out to your microwaves, your receptacles, 
microwave, depending on how big of an inverter you have. A converter takes 110 volts when you plug in and converts it to 12 volt to supply your uh, 12 volt fuse panel and charge your batteries. Now, if your inverter is big enough, they are called an inverter converter charger because it works both directions. It's an inverter, so it takes 12 volt, makes 110 out of it, puts it all over. But when you plug in, it notices the uh, 110 reverses and charges your 12 volt. Is that what I have? Yep. You have an inverter converter charger. Does that also, I mean, one thing you guys didn't talk about, when I had my trailer, I had one of those power surge guard things. Do, because I think that's important. I believe your new, does her new air have one installed? That's what I'm wondering. Yours has one from the factory. There's a progressive dynamic, dynamic. and it's built into the transfer switch. It's kind of new, it's interesting, and yeah, you don't have to worry about it. Now, what she's talking about is a, surge protector. I'll give you the short version. This is a, a huge, this is a build-in version where we put it in. We have plug-in versions. They wind up on YouTube because they get stolen because these are not the most inexpensive piece. Just like the water pressure regulator regulates the pressure, this checks for bad current, reverse polarity, too high a voltage. If you get a power spike, it's just like getting 240 in. So would that mount in the where the electrical cord is Dep in that de box? Depending on what, how much room is in there, yes. Usually on yours it goes in the compartment right behind it. Yeah. Well, mine was just uh, just one that I hooked up. Power supply. And that was nice. No, yours was just plugged in. It wasn't installed. So you it on the riser outside. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you just plug it into the three prong or four prong outlet, and then, and then you your plug thing. your coach into that. Yep, there's in ones you can buy. Okay. And that was nice. And, and if you're going to weird places, buy a lock. You, yeah, buy a lock. They come with a lock, so when you plug them in, they have a lock that goes over the plug. So you put a padlock in to keep people from stealing them. But if you go kind of to, if you're going to just like take off across the United States, it's probably a good thing to have one. Like out here, they have the big face plate that goes on the electrical <coughs> riser from the ground. Would you put a padlock on that face plate or would you go over the top of that converter? You could put it there or I would get the lock that goes over the where you plug it in. I see. Yeah, because more than likely by the time you plug into that and then plug into the box, it's hanging down below that face plate. Okay. So should we buy a, an we have the four prong and we will leap all the way back to the start of this. We have a four prong, 50 amp plug. You want to stay with a 50 amp. It, uh, so we need to go 50, a 50, 50 or 30 and a 50. Well, uh, here's here's the real answer. These things, these things are rated in joules. What they are is a fuse. And they are designed to absorb the current. Let's say you've got 11,000 volts coming at you. In four or five nanoseconds, it will absorb the current before it, it <coughs> excuse me, before it, it melts, so it doesn't go into the coach. A cheap one won't have nearly the capacity as a really good one, and they're rated in barns. This one's like 3,600, and the the cheaper ones may be 80. So the cheap ones, they're going to allow a current to pass through while they fry. The good ones will fry before any current passes through. That's the difference. And the 50 amp ones have a much higher barn drain than a 30 amp. So you don't want to neck it down after okay. this. You want to neck it down before and, and let this pass it. Always buy a 50. If you have a 50 amp service, buy a 50 amp service. Well, this is the plug you're going to buy. Four in, three out. Okay. Then you can buy a little one that's three out, two out. Right. Like the plug I plug it in your hair dryer. Yeah, I have, we have one now that's a, a three to a regular <coughs> 10. 
but I need to get one that has the, the two like that. Well, uh, it has three. It's a 30, and that's 50. I'll have to get the other one in, because I just purchased one there, because I plugged it into a, a friend's house and took it out there, and it was a 110 plug. Yeah, so you got the 15, you got the 30 to 15. That, okay. Right. Which is good to have. You can't use much on it, but at least you get right. charging, and you get And it just stored while we were there, so it wasn't like we were yeah. using it. That's what I stored on. My 50 amp right now is stored with a 15 amp cord coming out the side. Just remember, if you're if you're going to go 50 to 30 to 15, don't hook up 50 to 30 and then your 15 amp plug, and then put a 100 foot Walmart extension cord on here and run it across to the garage. If you're going to go 75 feet over the garage to plug it in, go buy the $200 extension cord that's a contractor's grade heavier cord because every foot the amperage starts to gain and that, that cord's going to get warm. Well, the, the, the person that I, I plugged in at their house, he had like a 10 gauge electric which is a very heavy duty. Yeah, perfect. More, you know, the common or more 16 gauge right. that you would buy at Walmart or have around our shop. And if so, you're only plugging it 10 feet away, that course probably okay. But, so I should probably go and purchase a Ten gauge on an extension cord. So if well, we have outside. extension cords, uh, short cord extensions in there, and that's the right way to do it. If you want to run an wow. air conditioner or a microwave, but that's for thirty. Yeah. That's that's for fifteen or thirty. He's just talking storage. Oh, okay. Well, storage, sorry. just yeah. Just go to Jerry's or wherever, buy one here, wherever. Just get an extension cord. But if you're only going to plug it in 10 feet away, you get a 15-foot cord, don't get 100 and just roll it up in a ball. So that's what Chris thought. Those are going to go in circles. We're going to go get some Thanks, everybody. Do you have any more questions before you leave? I don't Fun. think so. Thank you so much.